With chief ministers and the prime minister agreeing on the need for India to have an extended lockdown, the question that still befuddles everybody trying to make sense of everything that's happening is how much do we really know and how much do we really understand in being able to project how deadly the coronavirus uh, spread is. We, we have some mathematical models, but many of them have been strongly disagreed on, some have been agreed on, and as happens in such moments, uh, every modeler has a different theory, a different working theory. Let me bring in now uh, E. Somanathan, who's a professor of economics at the Indian Statistical Institute, and uh, you had a very interesting paper that I happened to read, and it was called, uh, you know, it, it basically suggested that we just don't have enough data, so we may be staring down an abyss on both sides of the argument. So let me start by asking you to explain as simply as you can for our viewers who don't understand numbers and I count myself uh, in them. Uh, how much do we really understand about how deadly uh, this virus is in terms of fatalities? Because you look at both Wuhan and the foreign evacuees from Wuhan and you look at what happened aboard the Diamond Princess and you basically say that we just don't know enough. And maybe, just maybe, it's not as deadly as we are all terrified into believing it is. Yes, I think that uh, if you just look at the raw numbers that we have for India or for the world as a whole, and you look at the number of confirmed cases and you look at the number of deaths, then that looks like a frighteningly large percentage, you know, something like 5%, 3% of all confirmed cases end up as deaths. Um, <clears throat> but that's a misleading number because we are testing people who come to hospitals. And people who come to hospitals are already very sick. We are not testing the people who have a mild fever or a cough and are at home and they have the virus. Mm -hmm. So we're not testing those people. Those people are much more likely to recover without any serious ill effects. And so the virus, if you just look at the numbers of confirmed cases and the number of deaths, it looks more frightening than it really is. So that's the first point. Yeah. Can I ask you to elaborate on that? Because here's how I understood it. Basically, I think what you're saying is that when we're measuring the deadliness, as it were, of this virus, we're essentially looking at people who have either already died or have been hospitalized uh, or who have shown serious symptoms. And there could be a large mass of people out there, maybe you and me, uh, who've had this virus, been infected, developed antibodies, moved on, never even, never even known that that's happened to us and that the sampling is not taking into account that those kind of people, and therefore we may be overestimating the fatality rate. Would that, would that be a correct argument? Yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly a correct summary, yes. So testing right now has been, the main aim of testing is to find people who are sick and then to trace their contacts. Firstly, you, tr you, you want to know how to treat them, and so that's one reason for testing. Uh, more important reason for testing is you want to trace the contacts of those people and quarantine them so that they don't infect other people unknowingly. So those are the main reasons that we've been testing and, and that uh, effort is proceeding and it's ongoing. Um, but that's, that's a different reason for testing than trying to find out how many infections there are. So here's, here's the thing. The reason that countries are locking down, including our own, is not actually because it helps you fight the virus, but because it gives your health system, your already beleaguered public health system, even private health sector, breathing space. But if we were to have a new understanding of this data, if we were to believe that this was not actually the most deadly thing, um, then perhaps we would even look at the concept of lockdowns differently. And just to give you uh, an example, um, I met a family in Aligarh where five girls had just cremated their father. The father had died from tuberculosis. He could not get an ambulance or a doctor because OPDs are closed, hospitals are preoccupied, hospitals are overburdened, and 1,300 Indians die from tuberculosis every day. So my question immediately becomes, isn't it really important for us to have some sense of how deadly this virus actually is before we start literally denying other health services to people uh, who have fatalities from non-COVID illnesses? Well, I think there's no question that the virus is deadly. We have seen large numbers of deaths in many countries, and we've also seen that hospital systems can become overburdened very quickly because we also know this is a very infectious virus because it has spread very quickly in some countries. That happened in China initially, 
And then it has happened in some European countries after that, and a little bit in the United States as well. So we don't want to get to that point. We haven't got to that point in India, and we don't want to get there. So there's no question that this is a dangerous virus. We know that much. I think the main reason for expanding testing is to have a better sense of is the infection spreading? How fast is it spreading? Where is it spreading? Which districts, which cities? So a better idea of that data and in, in real time, right? Without a long lag, that's what will help us figure out where the stricter measures should be and where we can afford to relax controls and let the economy breathe. Because right now the lockdown is suffocating the economy. Yeah. And hence, I think it's really important to understand how terrified we need to be of this. And I'm, I'm with you. I'm not trying to underestimate the gravity of what the world and India is dealing with. But I'm just wondering uh, whether there is, as your paper raises the question, overestimation of the deadliness of this virus. Now, one of the arguments you make is in favor of a random sample of the population being tested. And the only uh, state that, that is set out to do that, as far as I understand, is Delhi. Delhi wants to do randomized testing. There are states like Telangana that are totally opposed to it. And they say it's going to cause panic. It's going to, we're already overstretched. We don't have the medical resources to spare on this. That's one problem. The second problem is we just don't have the rapid diagnostic kits. We're still doing the PCR virus test, which is, you know, there's a shortage of kits already. So how do we do this random sampling? How do we get the resources to do it? And what might it tell us? Well, there are two separate questions here. One is obviously if you don't have enough kits or you don't have enough medical personnel to go out and take the samples, then you can't do it, right? You have to use whatever kits you have and personnel you have to test the people who are really sick and are coming into the hospitals. We can only go to random sampling when we, we have enough production capacity and we're turning out enough kits that we have some kits to spare for larger population monitoring. Now, I think that we might get to that point quite soon, even if we haven't got to it already, right? So, but it's an important point to get to because that's the only way we can know how, how that's the only way we can know reliably where is the virus spreading and how fast is it spreading, right? It's only by doing those random samples that you know it. Because you can look at the deaths, you can look at the hospitalizations, but you have to understand that when somebody dies of COVID-19 in a hospital, they probably contracted that infection two or three weeks ago, right? And so what you're looking at when you're looking at deaths is the state of the infection two or three weeks ago. If you're looking at hospitalizations, you're looking at the state of the infection a week or more ago. And this is a situation that's changing very rapidly, right? So it's trying to adjust to something with a very long time lag, and that can lead to, for you to make mistaken decisions. So that's why sampling, random sampling, which will give you the state of the infection today, or yesterday, or you know, day before yesterday, with a much shorter lag. That's why it will be very useful. So let me ask you a layperson's question. You you mentioned the lockdown, uh, you know, choking livelihoods, and I've been on the ground, and that's absolutely right. And there's a real fear that, uh, you know, so many people have said to me, the poverty is going to kill us before the virus. That that may sound rhetorical, but in some cases, amongst upwards, that may actually be true. Uh, you also spoke about mistaken decisions. Now these decisions are being taken on the basis of some understanding of data. Do you, believe, do you believe that the data is simply incomplete for countries to go into lockdown? Or do you believe that there is enough basis to go into lockdown? Well, I really don't know. You see, I don't have all the information available. So I can't say whether that's the, that's, you know, whether lockdown or an extension of the lockdown at this point of time is the best possible decision given the information we have, right? I don't know that because uh, obviously the government is monitoring the situation. They have a lot of information. They have many qualified people and they're taking these decisions. And I, everybody knows that we are walking a tightrope here, right? The whole country is walking a tightrope. Um, if you fall off on one side, you get hammered by the virus, which will spread very rapidly and you get overwhelmed. You fall off on the other side, you get hammered by the fact that the economy is choked, right? So it, we are all walking a tightrope. There is no easy way out here. So. All I'm suggesting is that if it is possible, if it's feasible, if we can ramp up the production of kits fast enough, mm -hmm. then we should do random sampling so that we, uh, we can take these very big decisions on the basis of better information and we're more likely to be correct about them. 
So just explain to, to people watching this why you started exploring whether our numerical understanding of how deadly the virus is uh, is actually accurate. You looked at, uh, you know, you looked at the cruise ship, the Diamond Princess, and you looked at Wuhan, the province in China where this virus actually originated first. And you looked at the foreigners who were evacuated from Wuhan, and you looked at uh, the sort of fatality rate on board the cruise ship. But on board the cruise ship, there's an argument that many of them may have been old or elderly and therefore more susceptible to the fatality. What got you thinking that maybe, maybe there's a danger of overestimating the fatality, the fatality rate rather? Well, the main thing, you see, I think experts understand this very well. So I think people in the government who are actually taking these decisions, they understand this very well, right? But the lay public doesn't understand this because after all, that's not what people are trained to do. So it just looks like it's very, very deadly if you just look at cases and you look at deaths. Then it looks like there's a large number of deaths compared to cases. Globally, it's more than 5%. In India, it's a little lower. It's around 3% right now, right? So we don't really know. Right. But what we do know is that that death rate is overstated. And using the Wuhan evacuee data and the Diamond Princess data, there was a paper in Lancet Infectious Diseases, and the authors of that paper basically estimated that the death rate is less than 1%. Right? Maybe it's about half a percent. Maybe it's even less than that. Right? But I think that that's one thing. Right? Firstly, the disease is not as deadly as it appears on the surface. However, if you compare it with something like the flu, influenza, which kills a lot of people every year, it is more deadly than influenza. I think that that we can be fairly sure of, okay, based on what we know so far. Also, now recently, just in the last few days, there have been results released from random samplings in two countries. One is in Sweden, in the area around the capital, Stockholm, mm -hmm. and there they found a uh, prevalence of about 2.4%. That is about 2.4% of people in the Stockholm metropolitan area were infected, right? That adds up to 55,000 people in that region if you blow it up by the population. And you can compare that to how many officially recorded cases the whole country of Sweden had. It was about 9,000, right? So you're looking at people, the number of people infected being maybe 20 times the number of people recorded in the hospitals as infected. Right. That's true in Sweden. In Austria, that was the other place, the numbers are somewhat less. The estimated infection rate was less than 1%. Mm. It's about one third of a percent. And if you count, if you blow that up by the population, it's going to be maybe five or 10 times the number of recorded cases. Mm. Okay. So what we do know is that the true infection rate in any country is going to be higher than the number of recorded cases. We don't know how much higher and we won't know until we do the random sampling. But, but the, main, the, main, the main advantage of doing the random sampling is you get up-to-date data on where the infection is and where it's growing. If you do that, then you can take much better decisions based on much better information. But I think what, what scares me in this is that obviously we kind of know enough to know that it's more deadly than the regular flu, but we don't know that it's that deadly that people should be terrified and you should choke the economy. And you see America wrestling with this, hitting its peak this weekend, but you, 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 know, you, you do already have a sense that the economy may have to be opened in May. In India, there's a sense that this is more centered in urban areas. It's harvesting season, let the rural economy breathe. I think what, what scares me is if we don't exactly know the fatality rate or what I think you call the infection fatality rate, the IFR, then on what basis do we take the decisions that we are taking? Because we are really choking the economy. Yeah, we are taking decisions in a fog of uncertainty, right? Mm -hmm. We don't really know. We cannot see very well. Uh, we are taking these decisions in a fog of uncertainty. And these are very difficult decisions to take. Right. It's a difficult decision because you do one thing and, you know, it's possible that the infections could explode. That, by the way, will also hurt the economy. Right. Everybody will get ter terrified. Right. And everything will shut down, lockdown or no lockdown. Right. So that's also a problem. At the same time, there's no question that the lockdown is strangling the economy. And the sooner that we can let the patient breathe, the more likely the patient is to survive. And I'm talking about the economy here. Right. So 
That's why we should just try to get the better information and then take graduated decisions. One last question, because this is not my domain. Why are there such variations between the mathematical models that we're, we're getting? We've had models that have ranged from, you know, 300 million Indians will be infected by July. We could be looking at fatalities of 2 million to a completely sort of different argument at the end of the spectrum. There are states that are still saying there is no community transmission. So why are we seeing these sort of this pendulum swing in the mathematical models? Well, you see, any mathematical model, it's going to give you a prediction based on the inputs you put into that model. So you have to give the model some basic numbers, then it will churn through the mathematics and it will give you some predictions. Now, the problem is this, that if you're quite uncertain about what those basic numbers should be, then you have to feed in you know, different alternative numbers and say, okay, if I put in this number, then what's my prediction? If I put in this number instead, what is my prediction? And the problem is because we know so little about the basic numbers, right, so far, yeah. uh, it is early in this epidemic, we know so little about the basic numbers that that's why the predictions are varying a lot. So in the end, your prescription would be that we, we just don't know enough and we won't know enough till we're actually sampling a random section of the population and then extrapolating from there. And that is why random sampling is so important. I was just saying that it's really helpful Random sampling is really helpful to, to know what's going on in the wider population because the data we have now tells us a lot about the hospitals, what's happening in the hospitals, but it doesn't tell us much about the, the wider population, right, except for a very select few people. So that's why we need to know about the wider population because these policy measures, should we open some shops, should we, you know, open some borders, you know, how should we go about that, which areas should remain locked down, which areas can gradually be opened. Those kinds of decisions, you want to know what's happening in the larger population. And for that, I think random sampling is the best way to go. Thank you. I think, as you said, fog of uncertainty and just not knowing enough. And the only way to know more is to test more and to test randomly. Thank you very much uh, for giving us food for thought. Thank you. Thank you.